university and student mental health. And um, Student Minds, the mental health charity, have really just have just come up with a new report. They brought it out a couple of months ago about life in a pandemic. 74% of the students said COVID had had an impact, a negative impact on their mental health and well-being. 65% of those reached out for additional help and advice. And only 19% got the help that they needed. So really, that's a, you know, probably a really good way of thinking that we do need some new models to start to think about what's this well-being for the digital age going to look like. So I'm hoping you're doing your A's and your B's and we can touch up, let's touch, catch up with that later. So as an audience of interested and passionate people in technology, the tech realities, if you added A, where we think we're in charge, we're actually most at risk of a tech addiction, which really, really surprised me. It's the A's that are at most risk. So obviously Eva and Paula are psychologists and they say the internet addiction is more likely when real life quality of life is lower. And having been to many alt conferences, I think very possibly we all have really busy lives but we also have very fulfilling lives so hopefully we're not going to be the ones at risk of, of, a, of a digital addiction but it's really thinking about what are the unmet real life needs of citizens of people and particularly of students that we're as we're about to all go into a very busy semester so I just wanted you to have a little look at this. Um, this is some of Paula's research that's just been published. Um, we don't actually need the whole translation, but the dark red looks at increased leisure time during the pandemic. And it's looking at different age groups, but I'm drawing your attention particularly to the 13 to 18 year olds, which are on the right of my screen. And you can see that their leisure use during the pandemic has rocketed up. But the thing has, so has their learning use. So everything's really going to go, everything is really starting to, to go more and more and more online. And are we at risk of burnout? Are we at risk of mental health challenges? You know, and there's a huge thing around the digital equity of what our students can start to have a look at. So if we start to have a think about leisure activities, you can see it's TV and PC and smartphones. So it's kind of that broader media mix. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So I've missed a slide there. So digital health and well-being, it really matters for all of us, educators, students, those of us supporting the education. So this is really a broad stroke, digital health and well-being and why it matters. And I think the point we're making is at the moment, the work's quite under, under theorized because we don't have any non-digital points of reference in this kind of digital, non-digital continuum. And this is really kind of started off by the work of Kratmer in 2009. And we're just arguing as we're moving forward, we need to support our students and to just to be thinking a little bit about how do we build in downtime as well as fantastic screen time. And I think that's really where our work is coming from. So I met Ava and Paula as part of the EU Digi Digital Competence Review. The EU set up a community of practice to revise and update their Digicomp Digicom framework. So they had some working groups and ours was safety and security and digital health and well-being came under this broader heading. And it's interesting that the original competence framework had they had well-being added later on to the, the very original work. But there are very few descriptors there explaining exactly what that is all about. So the EU competent digital competence framework, they've got their five key areas 
and each area is then subdivided into eight proficiency levels. And um, if you go on to slide share and follow me, this will be up here, up there later on. And of course, you can access the slides after the conference as well with all the hyperlinks. So you can see that safety is just kind of one area. And we're really arguing that digital well-being and security, particularly as we move into post-pandemic, needs to be really highlighted far, far more. So this is the um, kind of the way in which um, the EU are looking at running everything through. There's actually a, a delay in the project as ever. So I agree, I'm working with this work, work package seven and we've put in our first stage of recommendations and they're all being mapped over this summer against all the other different working groups and starting to come up with what's going to be the kind of overarching key messages for digital health and well-being. So my slides are jumping very quickly. Let me just move forward. Here we go. That's better. So I think probably in the UK, we're very, very familiar with the JISC model, which, you know, and the work Helen Beetham did to that, and the, the JISC um, digital health and well-being work that's been done already and I think that's very interesting because the digital insights work that the students have that um, the recent student survey looks at students and 80 84 percent of them said they had trouble getting online so this idea of kind of robust wi-fi and easy to get online it's sort of an equity issue getting online but students also struggle to navigate around when they're online. And so they're spending quite a lot of time and effort trying to move around the systems, the VLEs that we've got up, and that is causing additional stress. And that's if they can actually get online in the first instance. So this works based on two theoretical aspects. And the first one's really grounded in pediatrics and developmental neuroscience. And it's looking at the problematic aspects of screen usage, particularly on, um, on children and adolescents. And of course, adolescents kind of broadly go through to 18 plus, which is, of course, you know, the students that are about to join us. So looking at those sorts of um, that sort of research and looking at that tradition, looking at how can we maybe look at framing downtime? The other work that, that, that kind of underpins this, this, this new model is that um, if we apply it to digital health, this is no longer an expert only domain. During the pandemic, lots of students and staff have been directed to digital wellbeing apps. There's currently a huge call out by the health funders most of these apps are completely unevaluated and very few of the huge swathe of apps that most of our universities recommended to, to, and our, to us and our students were approved on the NHS digital platform. So people are doing a lot more diagnosis online, as we all know, we all Google our, all our different, our different health needs. But a lot of the information that we're coming up with isn't evidence based. And you need to know where to go to get that evidence base. And that's a lot about what the GISC work and the EU digital competence framework is about, is developing those critical digital skills. So um, Professor Bitzer is arguing that it's not just individual responsibility, but those of us designing systems need to start to include, particularly in health, health literary responsiveness and make it far more significant to design in good practice, evidence-based practice, and to think about really developing that kind of critical framework to enable people to have confidence in some of the sites that we're, that we're looking at and that we're looking for. 
So this is the new model that they've come up when we look at e-health literacy. And then I'm going to ask you in a minute to think a little bit about how could we start to think about perhaps taking some of these factors and designing them into university type settings. So if we have a look on the screen, you can see there's screen media related benefits and risks. And we all know that with, with online, you know, there's benefits and risks with things that, that we're accessing. So there's kind of this meta level e-health literacy. And if you're looking at high usage, what we're looking at is we need people to have technical media use skills, basic literacy and numeracy skills, which comes back to understanding evidence bases, particularly large health populations and the way in which the evidence base for health is created. And also to have critical usage skills for, for all of us, but also for our students. The non-usage side, which is the side that's really kind of not particularly foregrounded at the moment, is how do we build in skills for limiting screen time and getting it agreed that that's a good thing? What are the skills for limiting content? And what are the skills for limiting dysfunctional usage? So there's sort of all sorts of things there that we can start to unpack. And what they're saying is really with this new model, we need to try and think of getting things more balanced to promote good digital health and to promote good well-being for, you know, they're arguing for adolescents, for the EU broader population, because that's where we're working is with the EU citizens digital framework. But of course, for us as educators, how is that going to be moved forward? So this was the thing I'd just like us to have a bit of a think about is you can see the pivot point is the screen related benefits versus risks. And then you've got medical research, screen research, and our digital frameworks are our building blocks to good mental health. And we're suggesting that in a screen dominated world, which has been accelerated by the pandemic, the challenge is designing in downtime and non-screen time, and perhaps in a more meaningful way than legislating and saying that superheroes have got to have naps. It's not that kind of thinking. It's, it's, it's really kind of thinking about the ways in which we can build things in. So new models and ways of thinking are needed to help us understand. And what I'd really like to do, if you could start to have a think and put some thing, ideas in the comments, is when we're starting to think about student usage and non-usage, you know, how can we start to think about building in just that little bit more of a critical balance and more downtime? Because everything seems to be pushing more and more and more to screen usage. So I'm just going to just give you a minute or two just to have a little think about that. And then I'll just finish off with my final thoughts and kind of some gaps in the research um, that will maybe point us to ways in which we can take things forward. So what I'll do, I'll finish the, I'll finish the presentation and then I'll come back to this so we know this is what we're talking about. So my final thoughts are kind of something about developing online and blended scenarios with a digital balance literacy in mind. Empowering learners by promoting skills on both sides. And also for digital well-being, I think we need to think about the whole person, not just the time spent learning. So when we plan to increase educational screen time, how can institutions contribute to decreasing overall screen and online time? Um, particularly EdTech designers, and I've got to put my hand up here as one of those ones who's always looking for different ways to build in more motivation and engagement and to think a bit more about gamification. But, you know, is this going to interfere? Oops, sorry, wrong click. Is this going to interfere with delayed gratification, increasing the risk of online addictions? 
And the conundrum, if we kind of go back to the um, sort of the, the neuroscience and ch child pediatrics is how can child protection or focus apps help cope with the pandemic? So health professionals are saying no, no online devices in children's bedrooms. And teachers are saying it's the only quiet place for online distance learning during the lockdown. But this is exactly the same for our students. You know, we're wanting them to have quiet study space, you know, find yourself some quiet study space. But a lot of our students don't have that quiet study space. And how can we start to try and limit this kind of online 24 seven, because it does start to cause issues if people start to get onto that addictive spectrum with sleeping and you know and then sort of mental health issues can can build up from there so there's lots more to do um the word cloud is basically neglected disciplines that should that that the, uh, sorry, start again. The word cloud is basically the key things that have been coming out of the research so far. And you can see there's real big things about more research needed, looking at education, sociology, media, and inequalities, huge, huge, huge inequalities. And there are neglected disciplines, which are things like, you know, if we can start to have a look at things like artificial intelligence, you know, what kinds of things are coming down the line where we can look at this interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research and start to look at offering a more, um, perhaps a more user supported way forward. So um, there are some selected references, which obviously you can go back and look at, but I'm just going to go back to where the question I was asking you about, which is, you know, we're all designing for the next semester. What can we actually do? So I'd really welcome any thoughts and comments. And Bella, if you could do some chairing, that would be fabulous. Thank okay. you. I'm here like a genie to feed back. Just some like of those a comments. genie. Ta -da. So we've had some, we've had some really good comments. Um and um one from Matthew Moran um is is fascinating actually and one that I think applies for learning and general work, which is promoting good non-digital practices like taking notes by hand, journaling and mapping, which I, I think is a really interesting one. I um, think and that's fabulous. And I think we could really start to, to, to do that, you know, rather than just stick a PowerPoint up and expect students to listen. Mm -hmm. So I think that sounds really, really nice. So the sort of that more creative way of, of building in as, we, as we're delivering. Yeah. And Matty's followed that up with as well with the idea of kind of um, small group teaching being walk and talk. Uh, rather than everything uh, being uh, on the digital platform like Teams. Uh, Pete Mellors followed that up though with uh, feeling a little bit wary of always thinking screen equals bad. So there's TV, cinema, video games, and online social, uh, which is different from doom scrolling. I know how he feels. Uh, and, and kind of, you know, the repetitive games. Uh, and I think there's something in that as well um, around the idea that there is positive screen time versus which I, I suppose comes from the sense that it's in some way directed yeah. rather than uh, one that you do as a, a crutch we're not suggesting in any way shape or form that all screen time is bad but perhaps there's better guided screen time perhaps you know um i've started to build in um, well-being and sort of uh, just well-being spaces for five minutes in my mm -hmm. in my larger you know my larger lectures that i'm doing online just to encourage people to have that just a bit of downtime for five minutes and to move around and to do something and so on you know so i think there's very small things we can do but there's also larger things we can do and um, i'm just having a little look well 
So there's another comment from the lovely Peter Bryant, who's coming at oh, us from yes. many, many teams at a time, time zones different. It, and this is something I, I really resonate with, the idea of yeah. Zoom or, or platform fatigue and, the, and looking yeah. at yourself constantly <laughs> as a well-being challenge as well. You know, kind of um, being really aware of yourself and the eyes that are looking at you on, on your digital platform, which I think he's right, actually. It is definitely a well-being challenge. And, and one, there's a really good paper came out recently talking about Zoom fatigue and exhaustion exactly that hmm. because we're mirrored all day and so it feels like we're present yeah and uh, Pete's followed up as well um kind of taking your point about a uh, critical you know digital and critical skills kind of applying that to your own activity online maybe yeah. that's something we could encourage in students it's which is um are we encouraging people to understand that they are doing something like doom scrolling or, or um, you know, a kind of attention crutch game playing rather than kind of active participation digitally, which I think is a really interesting idea. One point, I'm, I'm going to go through the uh, comments, but the, there's other things that I think we can do as, a, a, as part of our practice in terms of how we ask students to kind of submit assignments as well, because there are things yeah. that we can do that involve them getting out and about and kind of out, out of their screen um not yeah. just type an essay or or do it so you know, there's some creativity around how we assess as well that could be you know podcasts or videos or other things which have oh, a I know. and isn't it a shame that all these wonderful wonderful creative assessments we could be doing with students co-creating and working in groups and you know doing fantastic things are kind of going back and now there's a three thousand essay on and yeah. um, i'm really interested in what david watson's saying about him and pete having worked in hong kong and students yeah accessing from mainland China you know so just assuming we're going to be able to do hybrid and live yes I think that's really interesting you know in terms of accessibility speed and reliability and we tend to think of Hong Kong particularly as being really tech savvy don't we but so there are and and this is something that we've we've done here in Sheffield and I'm sure other universities have done which is actually trying to create a stable reliable service that allows students to access from mainland China and we did we did that last year and we're we're obviously yeah. going to have to do it this year as well and I think you're right understanding that being tech savvy is not the same as actually being able to access yeah. everything that other students do and you know kind of uh you know pivoting around firewalls looking at different vpns yeah. that, it, that's asking students to do so much more than sitting in their bedroom and just accessing resources or, or, or and it's just that i just think there's this simplistic way of looking that all the students can just go online and everything's there and there yeah. are just these huge range of inclusive equity issues so the other thing Jennifer um, has put in her comments that she's realizing the important of co importance of conscious planning, and that includes yeah. non-digital learning activities for online courses. I think that's a really good point. Is the idea that we as practitioners think about building that in? Um, and Matthew's followed up as well, and and is also saying about. Um, ergonomics and supporting people to adopt safe non-harmful ways of sitting and standing so that's definitely my watch i obey my watch when it tells me to stand up but i don't know if that's it well, i don't know if that's the same for everyone isn't it we don't have that in our student welcome brochures do we we don't no. say you know this is the way to sit here's your risk you know this is how you can set your screen up your monitor up you need to be doing this this and that you know um i've got colleagues who live in very small spaces and one particular colleague sits down for one and then he stands up with his laptop on his ironing board yeah to stand up and to do something and to move around when he has to be at home but i don't know if we ask students you know after half an hour of sitting or you know that's something yeah. again we could consider and uh, pete's also following up with the always online uh, causing problems with people's vision and um, I, I know I've experienced that with my middle-aged eyes so yeah. I, I think and again that's another thing that we're asking students to do uh, similar things similar levels of engagement that we do ourselves and we're we know we know we're struggling with that as well yeah. one of the um, one of the things I've noticed again you know about the camera on or camera off is students most often choose to go camera off and that is probably a subtle way of telling us something uh, so I, I think it's also, um, yeah, and Pete's following that up with again, which is people's spaces, bedrooms of the children yeah. that you mentioned earlier on in the presentation and our students. I had a colleague who challenged learning. students to say one, two, three cameras on and found one in the bath. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, so, that's, that's not a typical experience, but you know, um, but then it's difficult for us, isn't it? Teaching into a blank screen. And it, is there anybody out there? Yeah. Uh, you know, and it makes you realize how different, how we need to offer different propositions. Okay. And, so I'm going to do my stern chairing and start uh, okay. start to wind up. So Debbie, you had a couple of slides with your uh, with your reading and other next steps. So do you want to just um, go back over those uh, before we end the session? And yeah, I'll that was just the kind do. of the final yes. thoughts. This was really just thinking about neglected areas, and it's just how much it just struck me how much kind of looking at education, sociology, media. It's interdisciplinary research. And that's exactly the thing that perhaps isn't being funded as the mo at the moment. If we look at the UK in terms of the REF, you know, they did try and make huge efforts for interdisciplinary research, but it can be more difficult in our institutions to facilitate and to reach out and for that to happen. So, um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Bella. And thanks, guys, for coming online and um, and taking part. It's been really, really great to have a, a virtual discussion. Thanks very much, Debbie. That's been a great session. And thanks, everybody, for participating. It's been really a uh, good chat. Okay. So on that, thanks a lot. We'll Bye, see you all soon. Bye. Bye.